This is intended to be a companion to a uh, previous discussion of dry snow metamorphism in the snowpack. Uh, so snow metamorphism is often uh, grouped into to either two or three different categories in typical seasonal snowpacks. And what I have on the right is a, a table that was borrowed from the International Classification of Snow Crystals. You've seen this before. So these are the types of uh, crystal grains uh, and then the sub-classification of those grains. Um, and then I have those broken out by the general types of metamorphism that lead to these to these grain types in snowpack. And so dry snow metamorphism we talked about previously is when you have uh, both solid ice and uh, gaseous water vapor uh, in some sort of equilibrium. And uh, the types of grains that you get are really dictated by how far from equilibrium you are. So we have um, generally in the dry snow uh, metamorphism category, we have the kinetically driven or persistent grain types. Those are the ones that have high surface areas like facets and, and depth hoar. Uh, and then we have the things that are approaching equilibrium uh, grain types, the rounded grains, uh, and the things that are sort of in between the decomposing ones. Um, once you... Uh, it, integrate uh, an additional phase of water, the liquid water, uh, you then have uh, different types of grains and different types of metamorphism, uh, specifically the wet snow metamorphism. And, and, and so now you have solid ice, liquid water, and gas vapor all in the system interacting. And that may not seem like a big change, but it's significant because uh, it changes everything from the heat flow to uh, the vapor pressure gradients uh, to um, the, the types of bonding and sintering that you see between grains. So um, we typically see wet snow metamorphism uh, once you have melting, right? Uh, once you have some liquid water present. Uh, so that can be intermittent, meaning it can be, you know, diurnal event where you have uh, warmth during the day that's heated on um, sunny aspects uh, where you have some liquid water introduction, um, but then that might refreeze at night. Or it could be that you have um, some sort of persistent level of, of liquid water in the snowpack uh, as if you're late into the season and you have significant or rapid melting in the snowpack. Uh, and then you have things like uh, wet grains. And, and what typically happens with wet grains is um, you are decreasing the surface area often again. So you start to round things out. Uh, the rounding is slightly different because you now have liquid water present um, and you start to get clusters uh, and larger polycrystals or groups of crystals. Um, and if you have lots of water, high water content, then you have this stuff called slush. The third category, which uh, actually includes some dry and some wet snow metamorphism and is sometimes a separate category and, and, and sometimes not, depending on, on the text you're reading and, and who's categorizing them, is this uh, category called met melt freeze recrystallization. And, and um, this is when you have um, usually a pretty significant uh, radiation effect where you get some radiative cooling uh, often during the night and, um, and heating during the day. It could also be uh, a latent heat effect where you have uh, crust that form uh, due to uh, new snowfall or, or new precipitation on the surface. Uh, but typically we're talking about uh, ice and uh, crystals that form adjacent to, to crust or ice layers because they behave slightly different than just a sort of clean cut dry snow or wet snow metamorphism that we talked about. This. So prime example of uh, a melt freeze recrystallization uh, form that, that you may have heard of are these uh, corn snow clusters uh, that people who love to ski on. Um, and uh, these things are, are typically poorly bonded uh, single crystals um, that kind of look like corn kernels when you look at them with a loop in a snow card. So as I mentioned, the driving force for wet snow metamorphism is that you need warm weather. And that warm weather either can be from air temperatures that are in excess of zero C uh, and or it can be from uh, high fluxes of shortwave 
radiation from the sun, typically as you move later into the, the water year. So uh, what we're looking at here on the left uh, are the function of seasonal changes. So this is just showing you the hours of daylight. So how much actual solar radiation is being delivered to the surface of the snowpack as a function of the date. So you can see um, you know, the, the darkest days of the year around the winter solstice here averaging out to uh, just under nine hours a day of sunlight. Uh, whereas we almost get double that um, out in, in June when we're talking about the summer solstice. So if you're talking about snowpack evolution out here in uh, April and May, you have significantly more energy coming from shortwave uh, solar flux uh, than you do um, in the sort of dead of winter. And, and so that can start to introduce more liquid water to the system, which then facilitates uh, more rounding and bonding in the snowpack. Uh, the other type of, of change that we have are just the simple diurnal changes. And both of these things can be happening simultaneously, right? We can have more sun during the day, which may heat up the temperature of the snowpack to the day to, uh, to a melting temperature. Um, and that may melt it uh, mostly at the surface, because remember, most of the sun is attenuated in the first 10 centimeters of the, temp of the snowpack. Um, and then as the sun goes down at night, uh, the long wave IR may cool the, the, the surface and we may get freezing again. Um, or it could be that uh, it's so warm that uh, the day and night temperature are, are, aren't that different um, and we end up having uh, massive snowmelt events. So we need to go back to our, our um, phase diagram for water. Uh, so we have the pressure, temperature, or PT phase diagram for water. Remember, we have solid over here, liquid here, and vapor here. And we have this, uh, which we call the liquidus line, uh, and E sub S is really representing that um, saturation vapor pressure uh, over liquid. And uh, E sub SI is the saturation vapor pressure over ice, slightly different, remember. What happens when once you introduce some liquid component into this system, uh, what you've essentially done is as long as both liquid and solid are present uh, in the system, you're stuck at zero C uh, in the system. You're not any higher or any lower. You're right at zero C. And it, what, we, what we call that in, in, in phase equilibria um, lingo is that uh, that the the system is pinned, the temperature is pinned uh, at the local melting point at that ice water uh, interface, and so it's stuck there. It's not moving. And the driving force here is that since we don't have huge thermal gradients because the ground is at zero degrees and the surface is essentially at zero degrees, if we're pinned at the melting point on the phase diagram where the purple is here, um, then then we're we're near equilibrium. We're we're what we call isothermal, meaning that the snowpack doesn't have. Uh, any significant temperature gradient to drive any kinetic metamorphism. And so we're near equilibrium, which means we're rounding. What's uh, especially interesting when you have uh, this ice liquid equilibrium uh, and you're pinned at that, uh, that zero to that melting point um, is that the melting temperature of individual snow grains is reduced over convex uh, pointy surfaces, uh, and it's raised over uh, concave surfaces. What that means is the, the more convex or pointy or dendritic shapes, the high surface area shapes that are, that are sort of, um, you know, staples of, of kinetic growth, what the universe doesn't want, um, those things melt uh, at, at a lower uh, temperature, or they melt easier than uh, than the concave structure. So essentially, what you get is this net rounding event where um, the the convexities go away while the concavities stay in. The so where does the heat come from? Well, uh, if you're going to melt the convexities, the cold convexities, the heat then is coming from the hotter concavities. So that's the direction of heat flow from con cave parts or the sunken parts of crystals to the convexities that dumps the heat and causes those convexities to start to to round and remember the universe is really always just striving to minimize the surface area of structures because that that surface area uh, you know has some energy component as it's interacting with the vapor or liquid that's around it which we'll talk about in a bit and you want to minimize that because the universe is always striving to minimize the overall energy of a system
Okay, so an important point is that since the temperature is pinned by the phase equilibrium, that's that purple line, right? We're stuck because we have both phases present in the system, so it's stuck at the melting point, can't move. That means that the concavities cannot cool sensibly. And remember, sensibly means that you're cooling or changing the temperature by adding or removing heat from the system. Uh, we're stuck. We can't change the temperature from zero because we have both of these present uh, in the system at equilibrium. And so the, the only heat flow uh, is, uh, is occurring by releasing latent heat uh, when the, the uh, liquid is, is, is frozen. So phase changes here are the things that are responsible for heat flow, which is why we call these latent heat uh, transformations and not sensible heat transformations. And remember, that's simply because we're pinned at a constant temperature. And sensible changes in heat require uh, changes in temperature uh, based on the heat capacity of whatever that, that substance is. So by sort of the same argument, the convexities can't warm, they heat up. Um, because they're absorbing that heat by, by melting through the latent heat of that phase change from, from solid. So a pretty crude drawing here is uh, here Q or, or heat is flowing from the, the, con the concave parts of a, of a high surface area crystal to the convex parts. So uh, from uh, these low points to these high points, that's causing freezing and melting, and that's the direction of heat flow. And the uh, cumulative effect is that you end up with these rounded ice grains uh, with liquid water at the interface. Another point that um, may feel nuanced but it's pretty important is that heat transfer is a function of the grain size. Uh, and so another crude drawing here, uh, smaller grains, they melt faster. So if you think about the rate at which heat can move through an object, uh, tiny little objects can heat much faster than large objects. And so uh, you end up sort of growing larger crystals at the expense of smaller ones. And we call this process ripening. And so in this case, the snowpack is rounding and ripening, which means small grains uh, disappear at the expense of being added or freezing onto the larger grain. The net outcome then is you have a bunch of rounded grains that are interacting, large round grains that are interacting with each other that can start to form bonds or clusters between grains. And we've seen that picture before in dry metamorphism because you can form bonds uh, between grains when you have low moisture content in dry snow, uh, although the, the bonding um, is not nearly as prevalent as it is when you have a liquid phase that can facilitate that bonding, and I'll show you why. Uh, but typically, uh, for a polycrystal or a cluster, you have a grain. A, a typical grain is a single crystal, and then the bond forms, and we have the neck, which we also call a grain boundary. And the grain boundary is essentially just the junction at which a new crystal starts. So we have a bunch of water molecules arranged in one uh, lattice here, and then we have another one here, but they're not contiguous as the same crystal. They may be rotated in space, which is why we have a grain boundary. And this is an electron micrograph of a single rounded grain, and then the grain boundaries at additional grain. And remember always, again, the universe is striving to decrease the overall interfacial energy of the system, the surface energy of the system. And by connecting or forming bonds, uh, these clusters are now decreasing their surface that's in contact with the universe, which is effectively lowering its interfacial uh, energy. And so that's the driving force for rounding and sintering. And when you have liquid water present, this sintering and the bonding uh, can actually occur faster. So with dry snow and dry snow metamorphism, like we talked about before, uh, we have a picture that kind of looks like this. Uh, in dry snow, we really have two interfaces. That's it. We have solid, solid interfaces. So there's an interfacial energy associated with that, which is this gamma SS. So that's 65 millijoules per square meter of contact between those grains, as long as it's a solid ice and solid ice. And then we have the solid vapor interface, which is this gamma SV, which has almost double uh, the interfacial energy. And so remember, we're trying to reduce that. So uh, one effective way to reduce the solid vapor interface energy is by making more solid solid interface energies. And that's the driving force for sintering or bonding in dry snowpack. In wet snow, where we have all three phases present, we have a more complex set of interfaces. We have four. Uh, 
And we now have the solid vapor, so that's ice and vapor, that's 109, just like we had before. Uh, and we have, again, the solid solid, which is 65, but now we have this new one, which is solid liquid at 33, and liquid vapor at 76. So we have essentially all the phases present. And we have liquid water, which uh, facilitates the diffusion of water molecules at all three of these interfaces at a much faster rate than what you get in dry snow. And it's the net reduction, the overall reduction of, of all of these energies uh, that is the driving force and the trajectory towards equilibrium uh, for the grain uh, bonding and centering in the, the wet snowpack. So what you get is something that looks like this. This is a, a, a micrograph, an optical micrograph of a cluster of ice crystals uh, that have undergone some series or, 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 or duration of, of wet snow metamorphism. Uh, but what's important, and I left the caption in here, is that these clusters did not arise from melt-free cycles, um, but because they minimize surface-free energy, which is what we just talked about. Surface-free energy is the same thing as interfacial energy. Uh, free energy just refers to a, a specific flavor, which is the Gibbs free energy, which includes both entropy and enthalpy. That's a topic for, for a chemistry course. So in wet snow metamorphism, we can have uh, a low water content, which means we still have all three phases. We just don't have a lot of water. It means we're, we're, we, don't, we haven't allowed this to occur for very long. We end up with these clusters that look like this. This is, a, this is like a perfect corn snow cluster. Um, and in those circumstances, we end up with pretty strongly bonded uh, uh, grains, meaning there's lots of bonds, lots of bonds to individual grains, um, and the bonds are quite strong, quite robust, because there's not that much liquid water to form lubrication uh, between grains. And if you have too much liquid water, you can actually start to dissolve grain boundaries back into uh, individual grains. This is often uh, the recipe for what we call wet slabs or wet avalanches in the spring because uh, there's enough cohesion between grains to form clusters and polycrystals that uh, there's stiffness and an increase in density at the top of the snowpack where this wet snow metamorphism is occurring. Uh, the contrast to that is when you have a lot of water, so we call water-saturated snow, aka slush, in that case, there's so much snow, the bonding is poor between the individual grains, and there's really no rigidity to that layer, and so it's not a slab, and it's often not a potential risk for uh, forming a, a slab avalanche in the spring. Okay, last thing I want to mention with wet snow metamorphism is that you typically can find some pretty significant evidence of wet snow metamorphism by looking at the surface bed forms of the snowpack. This is a, a photo I took in the Chugach Range uh, a few years ago that showed these things called surface runnels. Runnels are these, these channels that form naturally in the surface of the snowpack, and you often see these on uh, aspects that have significant sun exposure. Uh, something, a similar phenomenon you may have heard of is are these things called sun cups. Uh, and this is evidence of, of lots of uh, liquid water uh, erosion flowing or pooling on the surface of the snowpack uh, as uh, the, the, the deeper snowpack is undergoing this wet snow metamorphism. So if, you're, if you aren't looking at grain types, you don't have your loop, uh, you can identify this by macroscopic evidence just simply looking at the bedform structure of the snowpack like this.